Thank you. I'm glad she still calls me her friend because I'm also reminded that she's my boss and she can fire me at any time. So. <laughs> but that's been true for 40 plus years. So. <laughs> Okay, well, as Mary mentioned, uh, I'm very disappointed. I would rather not be standing before you today. I was excited about having Dr. Chakraborty here and presenting to you on a, a number of aspects of cardiovascular medicine, but primarily on the venture we're undertaking in India, which I'll speak to you about here at the end of class, at the end of the session. Uh, he, his daughter is in Detroit as a, a medical resident at Wayne State University. I uh, just started there, so she'll be there for the next four years, so no doubt that when he and Arandati get back to Michigan from time to time, we'll have other dinners with them, and someday I hope he'll be able to come and, and actually do a presentation like this himself. Um, but as we begin here today, I'm going to give you a little bit of background because I'm not going to assume that most of you know uh, what a heart attack is. Uh, Many of you in cardio, I've got a number of my cardio students here. I could probably ask either one of them to come up and they could do it. Anybody willing to do that? No willing? You just had an exam on it. You should be able to do that. Uh, so I'm gonna, it's going to be a little redundant for them. But for the rest of you, I'm going to speak a little bit about cardiovascular disease and exactly what it is and what it isn't, especially when we use that term in very broad sense, heart attack. It's overused. It's not fully understood what a heart attack really is by, um, by most people. Um, and then I'm going to share with you um, our meeting with Dr. Chakraborty back in January and how things have progressed to the point where, where we are today. Um, first of all, I want to give you a little bit of background as to um, how I happen to be standing before you here today speaking about cardiovascular health, cardiovascular medicine. It's a journey I never expected. When I was in your seats years ago, and by the way, this science building was built my sophomore year, so I've sat in these same seats on the other side of it, so to speak. And uh, when I left here with a, as a biology major, a physical education major at the time, going to the University of Maryland, uh, I knew I wanted to coach and teach in a Christian college. I knew I needed a master's degree. Uh, Dr. Comden, my coach, and at that time the chair of the department, and Hank Burbridge, who was the athletic director, baseball coach, they both aimed me toward Maryland because that's where they both did their master's degree work. And a year later, uh, Coach Riggleman joined me at Maryland, so both of us attended Maryland. But at Maryland, um, about the second year I think I was there, um, our advisor one day, said to a group of us in a class, um, because I focused bringing my biology background together with my physical education background, my focus was physiology of exercise, which was a fairly new field at that point in time. And one day our uh, advisor said to us in a group, uh, we have a cardiologist teaching a course next semester called Cardiovascular Dynamics, and uh, I'd like you all to sign up for it. So I did. That conversation changed my life. Uh, I'll never forget, even as I studied anatomy and physiology here as an undergraduate, the cardiovascular system was always the one that just kind of got my attention. And uh, taking a graduate course from a cardiologist, um, I shared with my class recently, I'll never forget the night he came in with two bread-loaved hearts. The heart of a young person killed in an automobile accident and the heart of a person who had died at middle age of a massive coronary. Um, and the two hearts, and they were bread-loaved, and we could look at the... Uh, the structure of the myocardium, we could look at the coronary arteries, the valves, and so forth, and what a vivid difference it was. Um, so I took that course, and then later on, as I finished at Maryland, I was up here looking for a job, because I had a wife and a child, and a master's degree, but no job, and I needed to find a way to support them, and I received a phone call from a friend of mine who said, if you want a job, get on the next plane, get down here to Washington, D.C., I've got you an interview at NASA, at the Goddard Space Flight Center, tomorrow morning, this was on a Sunday. Turned out he knew the guy that was running the executive fitness program for NASA there at the Goddard Space Flight Center. That guy was leaving, but he was going to be interviewing his replacement. And they were common friends. I didn't know the other guy, but they, they were common friends. And uh, uh, I jumped on the next plane, interviewed, and I was hired at NASA. And my first job out of my formal academic training was working there at NASA. They had an executive fitness program whereby every year, any executive with NASA had a physical, if they were with the company 15 years or more, they had to have a physical in our medical complex. If the doctor determined they had two or more cardiovascular risk factors, they were referred to my program. My job then was to schedule and conduct an EKG stress test with the cardiologist 
And then uh, we would sit down and look at the EKG. We'd make final interpretation if everything is fine. That employee then was allowed to come over to my facility three days a week, and I personally trained the individual. Uh, and that was my first job, and it was a, a wonderful experience there. Uh, years later, you know, the doors opened for me to uh, move on and, uh, and uh, teach at Roberts Wesleyan, a sister college. And it was that situation where I decided, well, it's time to pursue my doctorate. I went to the University of Buffalo. One of my professors there said, you know, there's this new certification process through the American College of Sports Medicine, which I want to do. It's down at Adelphi University this summer for 10 days. Uh, and he said, I don't want to go by myself. Would you like to come with me? And I'd never heard of that certification, but I said, sure, went along. Again, a point that changed my life. Uh, because I secured what was called the, now it's called the clinical exercise uh, physiologist certification. It's the type of certification you need to work in areas like cardiac rehabilitation. And back then, uh, I was one of the earlier ones to actually do that certification. As part of that process, I met a physician in Rochester, New York. His name was Dr. Alvini uh, Santos. And he said to me, if you're interested in cardiac rehab, why don't you come and spend a semester with me at St. Mary's Hospital in Rochester and get your feet wet? And wow, I thought, what a great opportunity because we were living in Rochester. I was going to school at the University of Buffalo. So I jumped aboard and spent a semester working on the floor in the first cardiac rehab program in Rochester uh, at this little Catholic hospital. And Dr. Uh, Santos, who was a clinical physician of cardiology at the University of Ro Rochester Strong Hospital, uh, Strong Medical School, um, invited me to do that. Again, a point that changed my life. I did my dissertation work in, uh, with the patients from that hospital doing my doctoral dissertation. And then a few years later, I end up here and teaching here. And one of the things that attracted me here was the fact that Deb Varlin and Ted Comden had developed the exercise science program to the point that we had an EKG system. I knew they did EKG testing. It was an opportunity for me to teach in my area of passion academically. I stepped out of the coaching into things, although I did coach women's soccer here for five years and cross country for three. But at the point I made the move, I thought I I'm done, you know, with coaching. And the thing that attracted me here were the, uh, the trailblazing work that Deb and Ted did, and we continue today. Uh, you may take so for granted, those of you that are in the class, uh, that's highly unusual, especially back uh, at that point in time. And Deb, I think you started that program, what, 1983? Uh, that, that was very, very unusual. Um, over the years, I've done a couple of inter or, uh, sabbaticals, uh, feeling like I want to stay in, in touch and abreast of the situation out there in cardiac medicine. And so I've spent a couple of sabbaticals doing uh, um, work in cardiac rehab centers at the University of Michigan, uh, North Ottawa, and Grand Haven. And plus, I've made connections with all kinds of centers around the state, done a lot of networking, and even in my cardio class yesterday. I called a a clinic. I had not met the lady. I said, I have a student that needs to do an observation. Would you be willing? Every year my students have to do observations in cardiac rehab centers, so I send them out to a different center, and each year that networking grows. And because of it, um, I can say that we, I think we are privileged. We're in a situation where we have an established reputation here in the state of Michigan in cardiac rehabilitation. Uh, I have clinics calling me saying, do you have a student that would like to do an internship? Uh, so we've been able to, to network and do those kind of things. So that leads us then to January of 15. And the short of it is that Mary and I went to India uh, to visit a, our daughter who lives there, who's been in ministry work there for seven years. And the university helped fund some of our trip. But part of the condition was that we had to do things that we could share with our students. Oh, I'm here today. Yeah, isn't that interesting, you know? Uh, we had to do things that we could share with our students in terms of learning outcomes. Mary visited a couple of IT centers. I needed to visit a cardiac center, but there's not cardiac rehab in India, uh, although there's a major cardiovascular problem, which I'll share with you. Um, so I made connection, and that's how I met Dr. Chakraborty, and I'll get to that here toward the end of the presentation. But first of all, to kind of set the the tone, as I said, I think a lot of times people uh, use the word heart attack and not really certain of what they're saying and not aware of what they're saying. 
generally the objectives, uh, I'm going to teach you some things about coronary artery disease. Many of you know it, and probably, as I said, could teach it. Then we're going to look at the prevalence in the U.S., the prevalence in Michigan, prevalence even in Jackson County. But then, interestingly, the prevalence in India, and then the plans for Calcutta, India, that are developing as we move along. This is the heart. <clears throat> and with the heart, we know that the key thing of concern, when, when we speak of the heart attack, we're actually talking about the coronary arteries of the heart that set on the surface of the heart. And there are four major ones. There's the main artery. It branches off into left anterior descending. It circles around the heart for the circumflex and then off the right side, the right, anterior, the right coronary artery. And uh, these are the problem areas. These are the, the areas that when a person has a heart attack, there becomes an occlusion and then, of course, arrhythmia and death. Interestingly, as I share with my students, you ever ask, to think about the question, how does the heart nourish itself? We think about it as a mechanical pump that pumps the blood out, but wait a minute, it's a mass of tissue that's also got to be nourished. And we think about it mechanically, but it's, it's, phys it's, it's living, thriving tissue. And I share with my students, when this big left ventricle down here contracts and it pushes that bolus of blood out into the aorta, the aorta engorges and it accepts it. And that's where we read the higher level of blood pressure. At that point, when you have a blood pressure of 120 over 70, it's at that point that it's at 120. But then as that engorged uh, aorta, uh, as the ventricle relaxes, the blood backwashes. So you've got this flow of blood that's going out, but then it momentarily backwashes. And when it does, it shuts the aortic semilunar valve and Miracle, miracle, you know, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. At the base of the aorta, at the root of the aorta, lie the coronary arteries. And you've got that momentary backflow toward the heart. And again, interestingly, in the whole dynamics of things, it's at the very point that the heart is at rest, the ventricle is at rest. And these arteries set, unlike most muscle tissue, that's the, the arteries go deep into the tissue, they set on the surface of the heart. So because of that backflow, you get the blood feeding into the coronary arteries and thus the heart nourishes itself. And then every stroke, that backwash nourishes it. So as we move forward with it, we know that these coronary arteries are the issues. Now here's the issue. Um, we talk about CAD, coronary artery disease, but it's also known as atherosclerosis, the technical term, or you may hear it as hardening of the arteries. Basically it's a buildup of plaque. This is what, whoops, go back one. This is what we'd like to see, a nice, clean, open artery. But over the years, and this is a decades of degradation that occurs, the plaque builds and builds and builds. Now, notice this. It does not build on the inside of the lumen. It builds underneath that, that enema. It's not in the, the uh, uh, space of the lumen itself at that point. But it does narrow because it pushes that lumen space. As you can see here, it pushes it smaller and smaller. So what we have here, we like to see arteries that look like this, nice, clean, glistening arteries. If you look at it on autopsy and, and uh, or maybe in your, your anatomy class, you look at a coronary artery and you lay it open, it's going to be kind of pearlescent. It shouldn't have any disease in it, but that's not the case. Instead, we see, particularly in societies where we have high coronary disease, we see this streaking that starts to take place. The sad thing about that streaking is we started to realize after World War II on into the Korean conflict and later on in Vietnam, casualties killed in wars, they would do autopsies. They started noticing in these young men that were killed in battle that 18, 25 years of age, they were showing this streaking on these coronary arteries. And of course, what we see, 20, 30, 40 years later, these individuals were eventually presenting with full-blown MIs, which means, you know, that placking continues to build, the narrow, the area space narrows, narrows. It might even become fully occluded. This technically is not a heart attack. Technically, it's not a heart attack. It's a problem. You can have arrhythmia, you can have death, but it's not the technical heart attack. I'll get into that in a minute but it can close down. It can, you maybe hear, have heard of a relative or a neighbor, someone that went in for an angiogram and oh, I had 90% occlusion in my left main artery. Well, you know, this is like, a, what I think up here is an 80% occlusion. The sad thing is, in studies that are being done now on children killed in automobile accidents, children, uh, young children and adolescents, we are seeing that same streaking 
and 8 and 10 and 12 year old kids today, the streaking that occurs, we are seeing that same streaking that we noticed back in the 1960s and 50s in 18 to 25 year old men killed in battle. But you didn't see it in the kids earlier? No, no. It's evidence of our society and what's happening in our society with regard to sedentary living, poor diet, no exercise, let's eliminate the physical education programs, let's, you know, uh, yeah, let's have cardiac rehab programs out at the other end of the spectrum, but what are we doing down here with those six and eight and 10 year old kids, 12 year old kids? We have an obesity epidemic, we have a diabetes epidemic, and we don't yet have it, but we're going to see more and more of a cardiovascular epidemic as those kids get older. You know, in medicine, we, cardiovascular medicine, we say, okay, grandpa had the heart attack at age 80. The son has his heart attack at age 60. The grandson has his heart attack at age 40. When's the great-grandson have his heart attack? We're starting to see that age go down, down, down. Why? Because of the way we live, the way we eat, the way we don't exercise, we don't pay attention to blood pressure, and so on and so forth. So you end up with arteries that look like this. <clears throat> well... I mentioned a few minutes ago, what we just saw was not technically an, an MI, a heart attack. A heart attack is a myocardial infarction, where that placking, it grows and grows on the, on the inside, under the endema, and uh, outside the lumen space. But then as that artery, as that placking grows, there may come a point where, where that plaque busts through. It busts through into the artery space. Now because of platelet aggregation, you know, you'll get, you know, you cut your finger, you hope it clots, you quit leaking, right? Your body doesn't know that inside that that same thing has happened. You've had a compromise of the tissue, you have a rough edge which draws, that draws uh, uh, platelets, they aggregate, they form a clot. That's what a true heart attack is. A true heart attack is technically an MI, a myocardial infarction where you have this clotting that occurs which is why it is so important to get the person to the hospital, be it heart attack or stroke, don't play games, don't guess, oh, it's just indigestion, I just ate a big meal. Get them to the hospital because if we get them to the hospital early on, you can administer clot-busting drugs that might bust that clot apart and prevent some of the death and necrosis that's gonna occur beyond that point. The earlier the better. Let the doctors determine whether it's indigestion or a true MI because the earlier you administer those clot-busting drugs, the better, and yet we know the average time between actual symptoms to reporting to the emergency room is around four hours. That's too long, you've got tissue death by that point. You get there within 45 minutes, you can start to reverse some of this damage that's going to occur, and once that tissue is gone, it's forever gone. And those of you in the EKG class, you know we're gonna learn how to interpret an EKG to determine whether that tissue is alive or dead. Procedure, if they report the emergency room, uh, they'll do an EKG. If there's reason to suspect, okay, there's a full-blown MI happening here, they're probably going to rush you down to the catheter lab. They run a catheter in either the wrist, they're doing more wrist now, but femoral artery traditionally, run that catheter up into the aorta, inject dye, and that, that dye, there's a camera above the gurney that perfuses the heart, um, and sh images the heart, and you'll see the arteries. And in this case, we see there's a pinching right there, there's a pinching right there. Those are, this, this person's a candidate for either two stints or, or, or double bypass surgery. It determines, you see the angiography determines where the arteries are neural. And so how does that work? How, uh, the first step, if you can do it, we're going to do stint grafting. Um, and with that, we run that catheter in, and okay, there's the clot. You run the, the catheter in through that clot. Uh, you've got this little balloon attached to the catheter. It expands and relaxes a number of times per second, and it literally crushes that plaque against the wall. It opens up that artery. Now, originally, balloon angioplasty back in the 70s and 80s, that's all they did, and then they'd leave the catheter, pull the catheter out. But what we found is that the, the placking grows back into the space, closes that artery down again within, a lot of times, six weeks. And now you've got to go back in, and okay, now we've got to do bypass surgery. But now we have the stent that's on the end of that catheter, and once they've expanded it, you see this, they pull that stent out, and the stent forms a scaffold, and that keeps that artery open. So now you've got, it looks like a little spring that's now inside. 
Oh, but we got a problem, don't we? It's a rough edge. How come clot doesn't form? Well, Borges Hospital in Kalamazoo uh, developed the um, drug eluding stints that help prevent clots. And any patient that's had stinting is going to be on Plavex for the next year. Until that stint grows into the walls of the arteries and now you've got a smooth, a smooth area for the, the blood to go through without risk of clot. <clears throat> so here we have, here's a blocked artery and the stint's been placed in and of course it images real well because it's metal and now we see that we've got an opened up artery. So stinting is the ideal thing but stinting doesn't always work depending on age, location of the, the clot and so forth we may have to do bypass surgery. Bypass surgery is used if stinting is not an option for whatever reason and what happens is they harvest a vessel a lot of times from the leg, the saphenous vein and they transplant it up here. Remember the root of the aorta? They suture it in there. Here's the clot. They simply take that vein that they've harvested, suture it in and then bring it down to the other side of the clot and now you've got a perfused myocardium. <clears throat> so bypass surgery if necessary but obviously a lot longer recovery because they have to cut the chest open. A lot of problems of course can develop infections and so on. They are now doing some surgeries robotically where they can do a 10 centimeter incision in the rib cage and because those coronary arteries set on the surface of the heart, active heart surgery, they don't have to put them on a, a heart lung machine. Uh, they can go in with a, a 10 centimeter incision robotically and do bypass now. So they continue to develop these techniques. They're just, when you, when you think about it, I started working cardiac rehab back in the 1980s when balloon angioplasty was the thing and now look where we're at you know we can do valve replacements now with a catheter run the catheter in there pull it out and the valve sets on top of the diseased valve and it starts to function all those things are not heart attacks though remember a heart attack technically is an MI okay so when we we move forward we look at okay what's the prevalence in the US not good you know since you know, Dwight Eisenhower started the President's Council on Sport and Physical Fitness because he realized after World War II what it took to get the American soldiers fit enough to go to battle to fight in Germany or in, in, uh, in the Pacific uh, Theater. Uh, and so he initiated the President's Council on Sport and Physical Fitness. Later on, President Kennedy uh, presented a paper called The Soft American. And when we begin to look at the demographics, you know, this shows, and what I wanted to show primarily, prevalence in the U.S., we see that there are 17, uh, 715,000 MIs per year. It's the number one cause of death. Roughly 600,000 deaths per year due to cardiovascular disease, or one in four deaths in our society are cardiovascularly related. And look at this map. And I was looking at another website last night. This is from the Center for Disease Control, just their demographic map. My wife asked me to put in a plug for the GES class. You can learn how to do these maps in GES. There, you got your commercial. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, the Mississippi River. Look at it. Actually, think about it. We have the Deep South, and we have the industrial states. Right over. Yeah. <laughs> the, the industrial states. Uh, yeah, Nevada's kind of interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it's looking at per capita, people moving there, you know, snowbirds. Why is, you know, down here in Arizona? Why is Florida? Yeah, there you go. But they, they talked about the top 10 states. The top 10 states are certainly Michigan, Ohio, Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, Missouri, all those uh, states. We talk about the I-75 corridor. If you look at these demographics, if I could narrow it in even to uh, some of the charts I've seen with the American Heart Association, we talk about the I-75 corridor. You can see in Michigan here, as you go west, it's less pervasive. The I-75 corridor starting in Cincinnati, Ohio and working your way up to Dayton and Toledo and then Detroit and on up to Saginaw and Flint, Bay City. If you look at those areas, it's the, the, again the per capita, uh, the, these kind of charts, very dense with heart disease on the I-75 corridor. As you go west, less and less over toward Grand Rapids, why would that be? Why do you think that is? Less industry, less auto industry primarily. And what do you have with the auto industry? You know, by and large, blue collar workers, hopefully becoming more educated now to the ills of smoking and lack of exercise and cholesterol and so forth. But that I-75 corridor, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago, all these, these industrial states, very high in terms of uh, risk for, where am I? You got some states where there's nothing. 
not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So it's insufficient data. For yeah, insufficient data too may be the case, but. How about India? A few things with regard to India. I knew this before I went to India that it is a uh, powder keg over there with regard to cardiovascular disease, which is why I wanted to speak to somebody in India about cardiovascular disease. A couple of quotes here. India will soon bear the largest burden of heart disease globally. In India, out of the estimated population of 17, uh, 1.27 billion dispersed across various geographic areas, 45 million people suffering from coronary artery disease. Highest number of cases in, in the world. It's estimated to, uh, to account for uh, about, it will account for about 36% of the deaths by 2030. Uh, major, major problems in India. Another, uh, um, just some of the research, you know, credible research journals. Look at this, 1962, as early as 1962, they were projecting issues of cardiovascular concerns in India in circulation, which is the American Heart Association's uh, refereed journal, 1962. Move along, uh, 2010, cardiovascular disease in India, lessons learnt, I love that, lessons learnt. In, challenge, in challenges ahead, Indian Journal of Medical Research. Prevalence of cardiovascular disease in India and its account of economic impact, a review, International Journal of Scientific and Research Publications, October 13. Another statement from the World Health Heart Federation. India has the dubious distinction of being known as the coronary and diabetes capital of the world. These results, which I'll show you here in a few minutes, show why and must prompt the government to develop public health strategies that will change lifestyles if these risk factors are to be controlled. Well, let's look at some of those factors. We're not talking about U.S. here. You'll see some parallels between what we see in the U.S., but others that don't align. Physically, physical inactivity. In India, 79% of the men and 83% of the women are considered physically inactive. Now, as bad as it is in the U.S., our numbers are much better than that, you know, because of things like President Kennedy and President Eisenhower and the President's Council on Sport and Physical Fitness and the fitness boom that started in the 1970s and 80s and has grown. Still not great, but certainly not as high as 79 percent, 83 percent. I'm sorry, I didn't have time to look those numbers up. I was putting this together last night when I found out for sure Dr. Chakraborty wouldn't be here. But these are, these are higher numbers than the U.S., how about high fat? 51% of the men and 48% of the women. Well, wait a minute. I thought India was a country that was primarily, you know, a lot of people vegetarian. Yeah. No, not the case. Not necessarily the case. A good number of the people are vegetarian, but vegetarian or not, they do tend to eat. Uh, I, was, I happened to be in an Indian household on Sunday night, and they offered me, I couldn't stay for dinner. They were wonderfully hospitable people wanted me to stay for dinner, I, I couldn't. She said, oh, you must taste what I have. So she gave me some, some uh, and they were vegetarians, vegans actually, they gave me some uh, chili, you know, uh, red kidney bean, wonderfully tasting. Then she hands me a cauliflower, but it's fried, fried cauliflower. So even though they're vegetarian, they eat a lot of high fat fried foods. And they also have, a, we found out they have a sweet tooth too, don't they? Um, <laughs> You, what, what was the name of the little dough balls that, that were um, soaked in syrup? And, oh, <laughs> they were too sweet to eat, but the, you know, for, for us, we, and we, like, we have a sweet tooth. But anyway, high fat diet, low intake of fruits and vegetables, 60, 57 percent uh, men and women. And then smoking, interestingly, this isn't too bad in India, India compared to many other developing countries. Think about the U.S. back when the Surgeon General's report in 1962 said cigarette smoking is hazardous to your health, and he started putting that message on the side of a pack of cigarettes. Back then, the average of U.S. men, 40, over 40% 40 of men in the U.S. smoked back then. Very few, by comparison, women. It's also interesting to see the societal shift. And those of you that remember this, most of you won't, but what did the tobacco industry do in response to that Surgeon General's report? 40% of men smoke, maybe, I don't know, the numbers 15, 20% of women. There were women smokers in the U.S. back then. Women's Liberation Movement. You remember the advertisement, you've come a long ways, baby. Virginia Slim Cigarettes. 
by the mid-1960s, the tobacco industry started to very intentionally target the women in our society. I started working in cardiac rehab in the early 1980s. When I first started working in cardiac rehab in a class of eight participants, you might see six or seven men. Three or four years later, we were seeing classes that were 50-50 men and women. What were we seeing? The results of the women's liberation movement, right? They could work in jobs with high stress, they could smoke so socially and it was acceptable, and on and on it goes. Today, we know that since 1992 in the U.S., more women have died of heart attacks than men. So if you're aware of it, there's a major movement with regard to women and heart disease. We used to think it was a disease of the men. No. It's a disease of men and women, and it actually kills more women than men because women tend not to survive that first heart attack. Guys, you might survive it. You might make it to cardiac rehab. Women, you don't. And women also demonstrate different symptoms. They don't have the classic jaw pain, shoulder pain, chest pain. They may have silent ischemia, or if they do, it's a pressure in the back. So they have a different type of symptom than men do. Well, here in India, we, at least we see only 0.5% of women are smoking and only 12% men. <clears throat> when we look at biological medic metabolic factors, overweight and obesity, yes, like the US, very high percentages, men and women high blood pressure, uncontrolled. We hope that there aren't 30% of men in the U.S. and women running around with high blood pressure. But in India, it's, it's not as controlled as it is here. High cholesterol, you think about 25, one quarter, one out of every four man, men or women in India have high cholesterol, and guess what? It's not being managed. They're not being given statins and exercise and diet and so forth to manage it. And then, of course, this one astounds me. Diabetes or metabolic syndrome. One third, over one third of women have diabetes or metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a precursor to uh, cardiovascular disease, we know. So a lot of things are stacked against. Another factor, let me pull this up, um, just from CNN, and it's a little older, but I think it's kind of interesting that we now have, and I've kind of suspected this for a number of years. I don't know if you, you probably can't read this article. Uh, but this article that was uh, reported in 2009, basically, the article, the gist of the article, the second paragraph, or the first uh, full paragraph next to his picture, uh, states heart disease because of a genetic mutation that affects one in 25 people in India. The mutation almost guarantees the development of disease, and Indians suffer heart attacks at an earlier age and often without any prior symptoms or warnings. So you can go through and read the, the article that uh, there's also a high and probably per capita a higher genetic predisposition. Why? Because we have a genetic reference that's thousands of years old, right? Where people have just passed around. And, and in, in India, there's also this uh, societal uh, relationship of arranged marriages. And you arrange marriages in the village, in the region. So any, any concent, the, the genetic pool is concentrated in certain areas. Uh, you know, that's changing now. You're not seeing as many arranged marriages and so forth. But uh, our daughter's marrying a, an, an Indian man in January, and we, we mentioned it, Dr. Chakraborty, and he said, what's his last name? And I said, Desai. Oh, I know the Desai's. By your last name, you're identified. By region and even profession, and even level in the caste system, right? So you've got these genetic pools that just are, they keep perpetuating. So as a result, you know, we're seeing a huge issue when it comes to not only lifestyle, but genetic predisposition. So as we move forward here, the rest of my presentation talking about Dr. Chakraborty. Um, I needed to visit somebody in India who could tell me something about these problems. And so, as I mentioned, my daughter is marrying this, uh, this Indian gentleman, but it turns out he's a U.S. citizen. He works for the U.S. Department of State as a, a consulate advisor. And so she said, well, I'll talk to Rishi and see if he can help make a connection. So sure enough, he makes some phone calls. Unbeknownst to me, he calls the CEO, the medical director of the largest private hospital in India because he knows these people. And the CEO, in turn, gives him Dr. Chakraborty, Dr. Chakraborty's phone number. Rishi calls him, 
and says, I have a professor from the U.S. who would like to visit with you. So sure enough, in January, we go to his hospital. We walk into his office, into his lounge area. His lunch is laid out, very busy man. He's eating on the fly. He comes walking in about 10 minutes later, and he says, I don't understand this meeting. What are we meeting for? I get a phone call from the U.S. consulate that they want me to meet with a professor from the U.S., but I don't know why. And I shared with him my background, shared with him my interest and concerns about the cardiovascular problem in India, and I said, I just really wanted to speak to somebody who could tell me a little more firsthand. I thought I'd talk to some cardiac tech or someone, not the chief of cardiology, the largest hospital in Calcutta. And he, sh he went on, shared with me, and he says, so what's your proposal? I said, I don't have a proposal. I'm just here to talk to you about, you know, the problem. He said, can you come back on Thursday night? This was a Tuesday afternoon. Thursday night, I go back to his office. Now he comes in with two, two of his staff cardiologists. And meanwhile, I've sent him my curriculum vita. I've sent him some information on cardiac rehab in the U.S., the Western model, uh, some different links on, on an email attachment. And uh, he'd read them all. We sat there for about an hour and a half and talked. And at the end, he says, okay, how do we do this? And I said, how do we do what? He said, establish the first cardiac wellness education and rehabilitation center here in Calcutta. And that's where we're at. Um, so as part of that conversation, 10 years ago, I had a student who did a summer research fellowship at Louisville, uh, Un University of Louisville. Some of you may remember her, uh, Mike, and I don't know if you would know her, Alexa Smith. And she came in my office one day and she said, I want to do a summer research fellowship at the University of Louisville. Will you write a letter of recommendation? I did. She connected. She did that experience. I got to know the professor down there through the experience. When you know Dr. Chakraborty's daughter has finished med school here in the U.S. and is, is in between wanting to do a medical residency, so she decides she's going to do a master's degree in public health where? The University of Louisville. So I said to Dr. Chakraborty, I have an acquaintance at the University of Louisville. He told me he was coming in March to visit his daughter and go to a conference. So I said, you know what, I'll contact the professor at the University of Louisville and we'll go visit some cardiac rehab centers. So in early March, I drove to Louisville. We had it set up where he visited two cardiac rehab centers with me, got to see it firsthand. And then uh, we started discussing it more. In July, when we met, he shared with me, I have a facility, it will be uh, renovated by the fall. Uh, I contracted with a medical, um, a medical exploratory uh, program company in, in Chennai. Uh, he said the business will be mine and um, we're going to move forward. My disappointment of this week was I was to meet with him and talk with him more about what is my role going to be, how are we going to manage equipment, personnel, uh, how are we going to deliver a Western model of cardiac rehab in India? But he's a doer. And you see with his credentials here, uh, he told me, notice the one where it says he's a senior consultant, interventional cardio uh, cardiologist, electrophysiologist. You notice he, he's practiced in, in Europe uh, quite a bit, uh, particularly in England. He practiced eight years there. He was doing <laughs> electrophysiology. He got called by a hospital in Chennai saying, we would like you to come back to India and practice medicine. If you do, we'll equip your facility with a state-of-the-art electrophysiology lab. So he goes back to India back in 1998, finds out he's only one of four or five doctors in all of India doing electrophysiology studies and cardiac ablation. He goes to this company who makes the equipment, the lab equipment, and he says to them, and they're a U.S. company, if you will fund it, I will train, as well as these other cardiologists, we will train as many physicians as we can here in India to do electrophysiology studies. And guess who gets to sell them the equipment? Over the next three to five years, they trained 500 physicians in India on electrophysiology studies. Now, one of the things I read as I went through some of these materials, even last night, one of the real problems in India is there aren't cardiologists like you would think of here in the U.S., so that's a problem. But he helped train over 500 doctors in India and on, on doing electrophysiology studies. So when he tells me he's going to do a cardiac rehab program and it's going to be the first of its type, a Western model in Calcutta, I have to believe it's going to happen. I only wish he were here to tell you, you know, where things are and how they're progressing. 
I don't know because he's been so sick. I'm hoping even this evening that I can spend some time with him on the phone and talk to him. And no doubt he will be back uh, with his daughter living and, and uh, working at Wayne State. I find it kind of an interesting, uh, I say to my students, God loves you and has a plan for your life. You know, back in the 1970s when I took that cardiovascular course at the University of Maryland, I had no clue where it was going to lead. When my lab director at the University of Buffalo said, let's go down to Adelphi University and let's do this certification together, I had no idea where it was going to lead. When Dr. Santos said to me, why don't you come and spend a semester in cardiac rehab, I had no idea. When Ted Comden called me and said, why don't you think about coming from Roberts Wesleyan to Spring Arbor? We have an EKG facility. I, I had no clue. I had no clue in January when we were going to India and I was going to meet with a person over there that it would be the chief of cardiology who, oh, by the way, has a daughter in Louisville who is now in Wayne State at Wayne State University. God loves you and has a plan for your life. It's really interesting when you look back, you know, that old thing, 2020 hindsight, when you look back and you start to see how things connect, provided also that you have a relationship with him. And you seek him and you seek his will. He will open doors, he will close others. And, uh, and how time flies, how time flies. It's astounding to me to think, looking back, you know, 40 years ago at the University of Maryland. Doesn't seem like 40 years. I still have an 18-year-old body wanting to get out of this one, right, Chuck? I still want to. I still want to run a sub five-minute mile. Uh, uh not going to happen anymore. Uh, it flies, but um, um, you know, it, it's just astounding. It's astounding to me to think I, I had no plans of coming home from India and being, you know, presenting today as I am. Questions, Mike. <clears throat> The use of the nicotine oh, and yeah. the tobacco. You know, I didn't see anything on that, but I, I, I would guess there's probably an issue just like in the U.S. with smokeless tobacco. Yeah. Because there's there yeah. and yeah. tongue and yeah. gum cancer rates are yeah. much higher. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's no doubt that. But also keep in mind this whole thing with the e-cigarettes, too. We don't know what's going to, you know, they, they, oh, you're not, you're not sucking in nicotine. Uh, you know, you're, you're sucking in things that are foreign to your lungs and your heart and your bloodstream. Uh, who knows where that's going to lead? Tom? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I've seen some of those studies, and they're talking primarily about people, marathoners, you know, where you're doing high level competitive type of uh, sport. Yeah, Iron Man. Those, those, those <laughs> sorry, Tom. <laughs> those, those events that are seven hours long. Uh, again, uh, there's evidence indicating. I would rather I would rather look at the issue of uh, I'd far rather get somebody in a cardiac rehab program moving their body than uh, be overly concerned about whether they're going to start to run and, and do a 10K and then go to a half marathon and a marathon. Because the other end of that, what we're finding right now, every one of you sitting in your chair are creating degradation to the arteries in your heart. There's more and more research indicating the worst thing you can do, even for physically active people, is to sit. Suggesting, recent study from uh, Medicine, Science, and Sport this summer suggested if you're going to sit for a long period of time, like office jobs and so forth, students, get up and move about at least once every hour for two or three minutes because you are creating a situation with regard to the health of, that, the, of those arteries, not just the coronary arteries, but throughout. Remember, artery disease is throughout the whole body. It's not just it, if it accumulates in the heart, it can kill you. But, um, but peripheral artery disease, other artery diseases, you've got to move your body. I would be more concerned about that end of the spectrum than by relatively few numbers at the other end. No doubt it's a problem. No doubt there's some research demonstrating it. But we have a far larger issue at the other end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. That's the West Indian 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. India has 5,500 minimum years. Yeah. So in this culture, they have Ayurvedic medicine. This idea that I don't want to use word shaman. I don't want to be that rude, but they're going to go see somebody in the village. Yeah. Because it's available. Grandpa did it. Grandma did it. Mm -hmm. It's cheap. Yeah. How much does that impact the fact that they don't have any cardiologists? They yeah. Just, it does. And not only that, but Dr. Chakraborty has told me a number of stories. For example, one man who has had heart disease for a number of years, he's seen, who is coming to his office, whose heart disease has advanced to the point where he needs bypass surgery. And he said, I've, I've said to the man, you need to have bypass surgery or the prognosis isn't good. Uh, in India, uh, the culture in terms of providing a wedding for your daughter uh, there's an issue of status, and he says, but I've got to pay for my daughter's wedding. And Dr. Chakraborty asked him, well, how many rupees do you have saved for your daughter's wedding? Because the other piece is they don't have the health care. So this, this man can't just go have heart surgery and have a health insurance company pay for it. So a lot of it's going to be out of pocket, particularly at a private hospital where he practices. And so he says, how many rupees do you have accumulated? Well, Mary and I figured it out. It was around, what, $7,500 of U.S. money, $7,500, $8,000 that he saved uh, over the years to help pay for this wedding. And Dr. Chakraborty says, well, I think you need to con seriously consider using that money to have your surgery. And the man refuses. And instead, he said to Dr. Chakraborty, just give me medicine. Well, there is no medicine that's going to cure that 90% occlusion in the left main artery. He's got to have bypass surgery. So these are other issues that even with, with the uh, medical care that um, they're not hearing. And then as we look at cardiac rehab, once a person does have surgery in India, and it happens here in the U.S. too, which is why we invite spouses to come to cardiac rehab, so they understand that this person's not going to necessarily have a heart attack and die because he's on that treadmill. In fact, his chances of surviving the next heart attack is even better because he's on that treadmill working out. So we invite spouses to come to cardiac rehab. But as he shared with me, even when we do bypass surgery, this idea of the Western model of exercise, once that person's had their chest cut open, they're forever pandered to. Don't, don't get up out of that chair. You know, here, I'll get it for you, you know. They think he's sick, he's gonna die if he walks from here to here, you know, because he had his chest cut open. So there's a, there are a lot of societal issues that are being, they're gonna to have to be addressed uh, that aren't, aren't like what we think here, obviously, in the U.S. Other questions? Deb? I'm just curious as I look at, like, fruits and vegetable intake, high fat intake, and these factors that, that weigh in, is it seen as a poverty issue? Or it might be hard to track because mm -hmm. there could be people living in poverty that have heart disease that aren't even making it to the oh, yeah. hospital. Oh, no so doubt. Are they tracking any of those yeah. stats? Yeah, no doubt. And that's going to be the difficult thing because you really have three levels of health care in India. You have the private hospital like he practices where a person can come in. Now, again, they may not have the health care. They're going to have to have the means to pay for procedures. There's also the, uh, the government hospital where that person on the street can go and maybe get some tertiary care, but nothing major. Then there are basically the ones for the, you remember what Melissa calls them, where basically one of her, one of her uh, women at Saribari had a husband who was in stage four uh, lung cancer, and they took him to the clinic and they said, nothing we can do for you, go home and die. And he, was, uh, he lived on the street. He didn't even have a home to go die. So Melissa had to help coordinate uh, uh, another NGO an uh, organization that had an apartment that they knew had an empty room where over the next two weeks they could send this man and die with dignity. So the health care status, just like the caste system, uh, the haves have, the, the others don't. So how do you get a handle on some of that when you look at the numbers? You know, one point, what was it, 1.7 billion people? Major, major issues. Other questions? Yeah. So even if they can't, um, you know, afford health care, 
and going at it from a prevention, you know, outlook, I guess, yeah. would they even consider it if yeah. it is going to tamper with their culture? Well, their you're right. It's a, it's a society steeped in culture. And here's the other piece. We spent three weeks in India. And I'll tell you, in that three weeks, we didn't exercise. You can't walk out the door and go jogging. If you've been to India, that's just not Alexis, Alexa and others of you that have been to India. It's, it's not possible. And particularly for women, it wouldn't even be societally acceptable. So how do you get a, a population moving when there's so much ingrained in terms of lifestyle and tradition? You're right. You know, there are certainly barriers that have to be addressed there. Other questions? Well, I'm sorry you had to listen to me today. I hope maybe next time it's Dr. Chakraborty. Uh, we'll see how it develops. Who knows, in the spring or whenever. He usually gets to the U.S. three or four times a year to various conferences. So thank you. Thank you.